Well, a very good evening to you and welcome to our lounge room. And thank you for letting us come into your lounge room or wherever you are at this time. It's a great privilege, even in these trying times, that uh, God has opened the door for us to have fellowship, not only on a local level, so that our church family can meet together and study together and pray together, but we can invite you and have your company and your fellowship as well all around the world. And so uh, wherever you are, we welcome you in the name of the Lord. We're going to pray because we're as ever dependent on the Holy Spirit of God. Whatever we say, and we're going to read about it in a moment, whatever we do, we need the Spirit of God. Only He can get in and awaken our spirit and teach us His ways so that we are fully aware of what He's saying. And that's the theme, of course, the voice of God. So, Father, we ask you that the Spirit of God will be active and will be involved leading us through this study tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. The Apostle Paul was an oracle of God. In fact, in his calling, when Ananias in Damascus heard that he had been confronted by Jesus and had yielded to Jesus, Ananias was told, because he received this with a little bit of apprehension, God said to him, by the Spirit of God, don't fear, Ananias, Saul is an elect vessel. That is, in the will, the purpose, the plan of God, in the redemption of God, Saul was not only going to be saved, but he was going to be used in a remarkable way. Well, Ananias went then with new faith and expectation and went into where Saul was recovering and uh, prayed, laid hands on him, and he received the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul went from place to place, region to region, led by God the Holy Ghost. And we know that when he went to Thessalonica, right up there in the northern part of Greece, Salonica today, uh, we know that there was a mighty revival of uh, Greek believers, both Jew and Gentile. You can read that in Acts chapter 17. We're not going to read it at this time. But I do want you to know how the unction of God came upon this elect vessel and gave him supernatural ability not only to understand the word of God, but to communicate it and declare it. And my friend, I want to tell you today, you don't have to be an Apostle Paul. God wants to use you, whoever you are, wherever you're from, whatever your background, whatever your culture has been and now is, I want to tell you that you can speak as the oracle of God. God's voice can be heard through your words. In fact, it's probably happened many times and you didn't even know. You have been surprised sometimes at the reactions. Sometimes they've been positive and you've been thrilled. Sometimes you have been shocked at the negative reaction and even the persecution you experienced and you thought, how did this all happen? Why did this happen to me? <laughs> what did I say? And what you were not aware of was that the Holy Spirit through your human lips and your limited understanding took the word of God that you had spoken, applied it into somebody's heart and there was a response or there was a reaction. And that's one of the sure signs that God is using mortal men and women, young people and even children, to speak his word. Now let's turn to 1 Thessalonians and chapter 2. 
The Apostle Paul writing to this church reminds them of his first visit there. And he came divinely directed by God into that region. Not only to Salonika or Thessalonica, the city, but also throughout that whole area of northern Macedonia. God led him miraculously to that place. We'll see more about that later on. When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony of God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you personally in weakness and fear and with much trembling. Hard to imagine the Apostle Paul being in that state. Well, we'll explain that a little, little, just a few minutes from now. My message, he says, and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. And then he goes to expand that thought. Perhaps we should continue just for a verse or two or three, maybe. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed it to us by his Holy Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God, for who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. We have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit of who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. Quite a slab of scripture, quite a lot there to sort of analyze and weigh up and rightly divide. Did you notice the simplicity of the message? Jesus Christ and him crucified. That is the principle Focus, that is the principal message, Jesus. Because, of course, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. So Paul declared the gospel of God clearly, powerfully, and yet in personal fear that he might be misunderstood or that he might not get it right. Perhaps they were the reasons for his trembling, realizing that he had a tremendous intellect and a tremendous amount of, uh, of learning. He sat even at uh, one of the great sages' feet, Gamaliel, and learned all about Judaism, all about the law. He was schooled in the law. He knew it intricately and intimately but he said elsewhere in Philippians I count all that but loss and but dung 
that I might apprehend Jesus Christ. And so that was the simple, profound, and eternal message. So number one, if you're going to speak for God, know your message. What is our message? Jesus Christ, him crucified, resurrected, coming again. The focal point is the Christ. And so that's what Paul came into uh, the region where he was, Thessalonica or Thessalonica, and there he declared Jesus. But there was this personal trembling. I like that word. He came in weakness. Now, one of the greatest thresholds for you being used of God is not self-confidence, but an absolute awareness that you of yourself can do nothing. That's what Jesus said all through the scriptures, but John 15 particularly. And he said of himself, of myself I can do nothing. And he wants us to come to that place. A lot of our teaching today is slanted in how you can be more confident, how you can be more equipped, how you can be more polished, how you can be more professional, how you can be... And so the list goes on. The 25,000 ways that you can be an accomplished preacher. Well, Paul didn't read that book. Paul said, I came absolutely dependent on the Holy Ghost. I came absolutely aware that I have nothing in myself to give. I came saying, God, if you don't use me, nothing gets done. I came reliant on the Holy Ghost. And so the consequence of that was my message, my preaching, was in demonstration of the Spirit's power. The less of me, the more of him. The more that I divest myself of self-confidence, confidence in the flesh, that is, the more he can flow through me. We used to sing a lovely little hymn and song that said, flowing through us, thou can use us. And that's the hope, that's the intent of God. Flowing into us, cleansing us, challenging us, changing us, and then out of a changed disposition and heart, a humbled heart, flow those rivers of inspiration, rivers of water, living water, that the Spirit produces. So that's how the Apostle was. And that's why these people embraced this uh, message so readily. Now, these are just as the signs and wonders of healings and deliverances and people being raised from the dead and all of that, they are signs and wonders. There is no greater sign when a man or a woman or a young person sits in the darkness, in the oblivion of not knowing anything spiritual, and then, as Charles Wesley wrote, the dungeon fills with light. All of a sudden, the lights go on and there is a spiritual impartation by the Spirit of God. And God wants to flow through us and into other human hearts. And I'm sure in your telling of the gospel, in your preaching of the word or the sharing of your testimony, when God has been active, you have seen people suddenly sit up and take notice. And you know that it's not just your voice, but it's the voice of the Spirit of God. And so if you feel in your heart, oh, I'm not, I'm not worthy, I'm not able, I can't do this, well, you're in good company. The Apostle Paul felt that. Even with all of his experience in the past and that great learning that he had enjoyed, and been enveloped in, and been taught by. 
he still came in simplicity. Now, Jeremiah also was called of God to be a spokesman. And he was going to speak primarily about the exile that was soon to take place. He was going to be a prophet to the nation. He was going to warn them and to prepare them for the exile into Babylonia that was shortly to come to pass. He was also given tremendous insight into the end times. And when you and I read his prophecies, we are amazed at what he is able to tell us. Things that we are drawing upon today and saying these events are taking place today. Now, being the prophet that Jeremiah was, carrying the burden that he did for Israel and Judah, knowing these wonderful things and having this telescopic vision right through the present, right through to the immediate, right beyond that to the end times, he had to undergo a tremendous call of God to receive this ministry. And he didn't do it easily. In Jeremiah chapter 1, the word of the Lord came to me, he says, Before I formed you, in the womb I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Now, by contrast, Ezekiel was a prophet primarily to Israel. But Jeremiah, Isaiah, and many of the other prophets are primarily not only to Israel, though certainly to them, but also to the nations. And that's why we're very keen to understand, read, and evaluate their prophecies, because they include us. Ah, sovereign Lord, this is his response, Oh, Sovereign Lord, I do not know how to speak. I am only a child. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a child. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and to tear down, to destroy, to overthrow to build and to plant. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you see, Jeremiah? And he gave him a vision. And it's from that point that he was called of God. And I want to say to you, you will probably go through a period of reluctance. The enormity of a call to any one of us is something that we are willing because we love God, but we're not willing because we know ourselves. That's the point. You know, it's not always rebellion when people are reluctant to embrace the will of God. They're not being rebellious. What they are being is realistic because they're saying, what can I give? What can I do? I am not equipped. Now, Moses said that. Jeremiah said that. Poor little Samuel was so confused when he heard the voice of God and he was but a, an infant when he was called and he ran the wrong way every time. He ran to Eli thinking it was Eli that called him and, and had it all messed up in his little mind. And it was Eli who said to him, Samuel, that's the Lord. Now, when you go back into your room, you be ready because he'll come again. If God's come one or two times, 
He's going to come again. Now when he comes, this is what you say. And I want to say to you tonight, wherever you are, a little bit nervous, a little bit confused, a little bit apprehensive, a little bit scared, a little bit, well, maybe a whole lot, tempted to say, no, no, not me, no, not me. Go back to the point where God started speaking to you. And this is what you say in essence, as Eli said to Samuel, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. There are two people principally, or two attitudes expressed by people in the scriptures. Uh, there are those like Moses, like Jeremiah, um, like many others, like Saul, the son of Kish, who when they are called, like Gideon, who when they are called of God to serve him, like Amos even, who think, oh, this is too big for me, I can't do this. This is, this is not my, no, 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 this is not what I choose. So they are reluctant because they are absorbed in who they are and what they are not and what they fear they cannot fulfill. The expectation of God to us all is too vast, too great, too mighty. We've got a, a litany. We've got history in the Christian church of great men and women that God has raised up and used. But they too had a beginning day. They too had a moment where God in obscurity spoke to them and lifted up his countenance upon them and drew them to himself and then said, I want you to go and represent me. And they wouldn't have all been self-confident. Now, Peter, Simon Peter, he was very confident. Oh, yes, 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 I'll represent you. I'm, I'm very well able. James and John. Jesus said to them, Now, you sons of Zebedee, you sons of thunder, are you able to drink the chalice that I drink? Oh, yes, 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 yes. So there are those that are self-confident, and there are those that are almost to the point of personal humiliation. I can't, I can't, I can't. Now, Moses was more reluctant than Jeremiah. He was so conscious of his inabilities. He was so conscious of his limitations. He was so conscious of those things that he was not able to do that he couldn't even envisage that God could use him. I can't speak, I stammer. I've got a speech impediment. <laughs> uh, I will be with your mouth, says God. And finally, there is a, a little bit of tension between them because he just kept going and rebuffing everything that God said to him. And finally, God said, all right, okay, okay, okay. Send my brother Aaron. Or, Look, Aaron can go with you. But God's intent was that Moses be the spokesman, and he indeed turned out to be that. So what is the point that we're laboring right now? Simply this, that don't panic when you get a call of God, and we all have that call. You say, really? Oh, yes. In Mark's Gospel, chapter 16, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. That's part of the universal call of the church. Matthew chapter 28. Jesus said, go into all the world and make decisive, uh, disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the authority of the Father, the authority of the Son, the authority of Jesus. Wow! We're all recipients of that generalized call to declare and share the gospel. Are you doing that? Oh, no, no, I'd be too shy. Oh, I'd be afraid of what people said. Forget it. You've got a call of God upon your life. But there are those that have got 
particular and unique calls. And they are, indeed, along with all of us, they have a unique calling, a deposit in God to be, as we all are, oracles or spokespersons for God. Now, there is this tremendous time of receiving the reality of the call of God. Now, we know that when we go into all the world, we're going to encounter, again, we're going to encounter response, positive, or reaction, negative. And we need to know what people are doing. They are responding not to you. They are reacting not to you. They think they are. But if you have the clear, clarion message of the gospel, clearly enunciated and anointing by the, anointed by the Spirit of God, their reaction or their response, negative or positive, is not to you personally, but to Jesus himself. And so you will get a variety of, of responses. Now in Acts chapter 2, and towards the end of that chapter, you will notice they gladly received, they embraced the gospel as Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, gave it. And they embraced the apostles' doctrine. They were baptized. No questions, no arguments. They, they were baptized uh, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then they went and they became part of a fellowship, which is a very part, important part of the Christian gospel. It's, it's where we are protected. It's where we are preserved. It's where we develop. It's where we learn to give and to serve and so on and so forth. And so they embraced the gospel that Peter shared. And then the Bible tells us, by contrast, when, uh, when Stephen, who was a spirit-filled, uh, wonderful pillar in the church, a servant in the church, not an apostle, but when he preached the gospel, who did he preach? What riled the crowd and the religious leaders? Of course, he preached Jesus. Did Peter preach Jesus? Yes, Peter preached Jesus. So the controversy and the crossroads for all that heard was Jesus. And Jesus is the message. And, and Stephen declared him absolutely without fear and without favor. And he then got to a point where he struck a chord. You'll always strike a chord. There'll be an ignition point. And the ignition point was where Stephen said, as Peter had done on the day of Pentecost, you with wicked hands took this prince of glory and crucified him, God the Son. That's what Peter said. And Stephen said the same thing because it is part of the gospel. And he said, why do you always resist the Holy Spirit? Why, Israel, have you always resisted the Spirit? You hate the prophets. You resist them. Well, you know, they were not a, uh, a crowd that were in favor of this message. And so they reacted, and of course, he suffered martyrdom. He was the first Christian martyr. And he was stoned outside the uh, city wall, and he saw Jesus as he went to be with him. So you do get wonderful positive responses, and you sometimes will find yourself in the midst of a, a malay. You'll find yourself in a, a negative demonstration against Jesus. And so it depends on the hard attitude of your audience, your congregation, or the persons that you are speaking to. Now the Bible tells us, quite capable, human beings are very capable of resisting the Spirit of God as they did when, when uh, Stephen 
was preaching. Now the Bible tells us in Thessalonians we can quench the Spirit. As the Spirit starts to move in people's lives, you will notice that some people will put a halter on it. They will start making excuses. They'll get agitated. And what they're doing, they are quenching the Holy Spirit. I have a lovely glass of water here. And in a moment, I'll probably have a sip. Why? Because I'm quenching my thirst. I'm getting rid of the thirst. And so some people get rid of the thirst of God. Many times they quench the Spirit of God who is working within their hearts to awaken them to a wonderful experience of being filled with God, being God-breathed, being experiencing the blessing, the presence, and the will of God, and they take some potion of the soul to quench that desire that's growing within them. Many years ago, in 1960, oh, I suppose it was 1967, I met a, a guy in Brisbane, he was a young fellow like myself, and I was giving him the gospel, and I could see that he had a really open heart. And I was talking to him, and yes, he was drinking it in, drinking it in, drinking it in. He lived in the town or the, the, the suburb of Baden, just near Government House, nice area. And so we would talk about the Lord, and I could see that desire growing. Came out a couple of times to the Bible college where I was, to go to some of the meetings, and didn't come forward, but he was moved. Then when we were on um, a, a, a break, a summer break, we went, I went back to Melbourne where I lived, and uh, he got a transfer for about six weeks down to Melbourne. So Eunice and I, we weren't married then, but we were going together and virtually engaged. We were going out to the Beulah Heights camp. And so I rang this guy, and we went into town to the hotel where he was staying, picked him up, took him all the way out to Park Orchards to where the uh, beautiful campground was, and he sat there. But all of a sudden, at the end of the meeting, when the altar call was on and the power of God was so manifest, people running down the aisle to do business with God, he got a coughing fit. He coughed and coughed and coughed and coughed and coughed and he said, oh, I have to go outside. Well, that was understandable, but he was really choking because there was this battle that was going on within his heart and soul. And all of a sudden, in the car, I noticed the change. He had become very determined. I said to him, what about us picking you up and taking it. No, he said, I'll be busy. Well, the weeks passed and I was back in Brisbane and entering my second year in Bible college and I went around to see him. He came out to meet me, a different man altogether. He had quenched the spirit. He looked at me firmly, without apology, without any nervousness, certainly without any conviction, but adamant of stone. He said, I won't be seeing you again. Uh, don't come. I've made up my mind. I'm not going down the path that you would like me to go down. And I knew that it was fruitless to try and persuade him otherwise. I could feel that a great gulf was between us. I went down to the end of his street. There was a huge oval. They were playing cricket there on that oval. And I walked within the perimeter of the oval and walked around praying. And I was praying for him. I said, Lord, I can tell what's happened. I know this guy. I knew that you were working in his life. And I heard a voice as clear as my voice is to me now. I heard a voice say, I have rejected him. And I prayed no more. 
I prayed no more. I just committed him to the Lord and left it at that. Never saw him again. Never felt obliged to even call again. There are others that I, for years, decades, have called and revisited and gone around because I felt there was that, that tug, that moving of the Spirit. But that was just decisive like that. Guillotined. And I realized what he had done. He had crossed a line, quenched the Spirit, and in a very sobering way, I realized I would never see him ever again. Not in time and not in eternity. So that's one of the great sins that you can do and commit in quenching the Spirit. The Bible tells us in Ephesians we can grieve the Spirit. And you know, some people are always going to be unable to accommodate the Spirit, and yet they will argue against that. But do you know why? Attitudes. Attitudes. Attitudes not related to the gospel. The Bible talks about, in Ephesians, the schisms that were in that church. And Paul, writing to them, says, you know, you're at variance with one another. You're at cross purposes with one another. Arguing together. You've got differences. And you're really in a terrible conflict with each other. Don't you know that you're grieving the Holy Spirit? Grieve not the Spirit of God. Now grieving. Have you ever been in grieving? Uh, we've all been sad. But grieving is a continual feeling of loss, of loneliness, and of going through the motions and thinking within yourself, oh, how I long for that, either which I had or wished I'd had. It's grieving. It's a process of mourning in your soul. And people do that. Do you know that can sap your faith, sap your energy, sap your expectation. And you'll find some people will find you a nuisance when you're talking about the things of God because they're grieving the Holy Spirit by their attitudes, by their lifestyle, by sin that they are accommodating in their lives. And that's why they react against the gospel or against the truth of God on whatever level it is. Well, Ananias and Sapphira, they lied against the Spirit. And I have seen people blatantly, deliberately, lie against the moving of the Spirit. No, I'm fine. No, I'm fine. Everything's good. Not a worry. No, 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 no. Don't worry about me. I'm fine. And they're lying against the moving of the Spirit. Now, God is very merciful. And if I may just use a personal uh, testimony, my precious mother, who I loved dearly all the days that I knew her, which were many days, um, she lied to the Holy Spirit. She would come under great conviction of sin in a meeting. And then on the way home in the car, she would be very taut, very tight, very, very uptight. And when we got home and uh, the people that had taken us in their car or she had driven into the garage and parked her car, she would come in and she would unleash. And I would usually be the one she'd unleash on. And, you know, she was lying to the Spirit. The Spirit of God was offering her the born-again experience. But she knew that she needed to repent of sin. She knew that she needed to get right with God. But she was lying to the Spirit. She would say to me, that church that you go to, that is not right. That is not the gospel. They are preaching to condemn you. They weren't doing any of the things she said. But she had to find an excuse to refute the right that God had to move upon her. But thank God he was merciful. 
Because after 20 years of this lying to the Holy Spirit, she would say things to me that were so utterly ridiculous that we would have laughed at it if it hadn't been so serious regarding the eternal consequences of a soul. And so we didn't laugh. We just prayed, oh God, please, don't let mother go to the place where Proverbs 29 verse 1 says, he who is or she who is often reproved and hardens their neck shall suddenly be cut off and without remedy. That was the fear that I had. Oh, mother, don't go to the point of no return. But uh, in late 1979, God walked into a Baptist church which, that she was attending as an unsaved, unconverted woman, and God began to speak to her, and her defences dropped. And that morning she was born again even before the first him was sung before the sermon was given she rose up within and shook and trembled under the power and influence of god was born again of the spirit of god lived for a further 27 years to nearly 102 serving god and thrilled that she had embraced him who had for so long sought to embrace her no more lying. And you know, she became the most transparent person I think I've ever known. I've seen a lot of people in the church that lie. They tell lies. They, they, they resist the truth. Don't do that. If God is speaking, go away. Go away, away from all the rabble, away from all your supportive friends, good, bad or indifferent. Go away, let God do a deep work within you and you will find people that do this they will lie to the holy ghost and the ultimate sin of course and the only sin that can never be forgiven is blasphemy against the spirit and i haven't seen too many that do this but blasphemy against the spirit is when you reject the moving and the overtures of the spirit of god in your soul, and you brush them aside while you reject the overtures of God, you are rejecting your redemption. You are rejecting the only way that you can be saved. Now, the Bible talks about these things, and let's go over to Psalms, the book of Psalms, and the 56th Psalm. Psalm 5, 6, and uh, this is a remarkable psalm, and it says these words. Fear and trembling have beset me. Horror has overwhelmed me. I said, oh, that I had the wings of a dove, and I would fly away and be at rest. I would flee far away and stay in the desert. I would hurry to my place of shelter far from the tempest and the storm. You know, many people, when they are exposed to the Spirit of God or by the Spirit of God to the truth of God, they want to flee. They want to run from God. And uh, that's human nature. We do such a, a silly thing. Thing. And, of course, there are many that reject the word of God. Be prepared as an oracle of God that in the genuineness of the spirit of God using you and flowing through you and moving through you and speaking through you, you will find people who react negatively as well as those who re respond pos positively. Now... In your own life, spend a lot of time in prayer. Do spend a lot of time in prayer, asking the Lord to give you an amazing sense of discernment so that you know not only the ramifications, the depth, the breadth of the love of God, both uh, in your own heart, the word of God, and also how to 
portray the scriptures. Not in some sort of obscure way, but in a way that's understandable to people. And uh, you will find at times that same trembling, that same sense of limitation within you, and you think, oh, how am I going to speak to these people? How am I going to speak to family? How am I going to speak to people? Don't try and work it out yourself. Spend time in prayer asking the Lord to give you understanding. Isaiah chapter 30 is a remarkable scripture. Isaiah chapter 30. And of course the whole book of Isaiah is really, someone said it's the gospel of Isaiah. Because so much of it is relating to the the gospel of God. Well, Isaiah 30, and what verse is it? 21. Beautiful, beautiful scripture. I hope you've got your Bible. Silly if you go to a Bible study and you haven't got a Bible. Goodness me, don't make me the one that's got a spoon feed you. Get your own Bible and get your little notebook and jot these things down. I understand that when it is uploaded to YouTube that you will have the notes. Well, that's good but you need your own Bible. Now listen to this. This is pretty exciting. The Bible says, The Lord longs to be gracious to you. He rises to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. And then he goes on to say these words. In the journey of life. This is uh, for you and it's for those that you speak to. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Isn't that marvelous? You will hear a voice from behind. Oftentimes we are going down the pathways of our life and we can't see Jesus ahead. But we just have this feeling that we're being shepherded and we are being guarded and he's got our back. And as we go and we begin to turn to the left or we begin to turn to the right and that's not exactly the way we should go and suddenly a voice will say, no, this is the way, walk in it. Cultivating the voice of God. I remember when I was a kid, I was 15 I suppose, maybe 16, oh, I don't know, and I had everybody telling me how to live my Christian life, what to do, how to do it, and people breathing down your neck and pressuring you, go this, do that, oh yes, you know, read this and go to this meeting and go to this church and that church is better than this one. And it was just like, ah, oh, I was in a wind tunnel. And I remember one morning going up to uh, the train and I walked past the Baptist pastor's manse or house. And I thought, oh, they want me to go to that man's church and others want me to go to another one and, and I'm quite happy where I am, but, you know, what am I going to do? And I made a pact. I remember it was clear as a bell. I can remember it as if it was yesterday. I said, Lord, I don't know that I'm an idiot, but I tell you what, I don't know much. And I am probably prone to confusion. And I said, I can hear all these voices of my friends and would-be friends, acquaintances, people trying to, you know, steady me, Guard me, guide me, goad me. I don't know what to do. I said, would you cultivate within me a capacity to hear your voice? Ultimately, I'm answerable to you. Ultimately, I stand before you. And when my life has come to an end, earthly speaking, I'm accountable. What I did with my life, the decisions I made, the choices I made, the directions I made, 
And Lord, I don't want to be wanting on that day. I want to be, I want you to say to me, Tony, come over here. Well done, good and faithful servant. Now come in and enjoy the joy of the Lord. That's what I want. And I said, I've got so many people trying to influence me, and they are, many of them, contradictory. And I said, if I really tried to study my circumstances, I'd be just as confused. So, will you help me? Please help me. Well, that's a few years ago, isn't it? 16, and now, well, you don't need to know how old I am. Uh, you don't need to know that I'm 75. But the point is, there's a lot of years that have gone between. And I can safely say, when I've meandered to the left or to the right, I've heard a voice say, this is the way, walk in it. I'd love to write a book, but of what use would it be? Of all the times that God has spoken to me, I was sitting at a dining room table in the Bible college as a lecturer, not a student, but a lecturer, and talking to a fellow lecturer and I heard myself say something and I gasped what I just said about myself and what we were going to do, what we were going to have. And I thought, that's not true. And I sort of backtracked, watered it down because he was aghast. And afterwards I went to my room and I thought to myself, why did I say that? Do you know it was a word of prophecy? Because within three years that took place exactly as I had said it. So even then, probably 20 years after that prayer for discernment, I had still a lot of discernment to experience. And now sometimes I can detect when God is wanting to speak to me in order to speak through me. Why, the other night I was settling for bed and we have a little routine here and uh, I set all the tables for or tables for dinner the following night and breakfast in the morning and then when we come out in the morning it's all done. You know, we just have our own little routine. Don't have to follow that, but we like it and we do it. I was setting the table for breakfast and into my mind came all these thoughts. And I could have just thought, well, that's interesting. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, that's a good thought. But I have learned over the years, sometimes when I'm at my most relaxed, not when I'm pent up, not when I'm het up, not when I'm all agitated, not when I'm even positively agitated. Oh, God, speak to me. Oh, God. Sometimes he never speaks to me in that, in that frame of thought. But when I'm doing something purely practical and relaxed and thinking of the lovely thought that in a few minutes' time I'll be crawling into my lovely comfortable bed in dreamland within seconds, you know, a nice thought. In that relaxed state, God will start to speak. And, you know, I put down the forks and the spoons and the plates and the bowls. And I went and I immediately wrote down. And within six minutes, five, four, three minutes, I don't know, I had a whole overview of a masterful mind of God transmitted to me. And I thought, this is the process of being an oracle of God, where God stills your soul. And in a relaxed state, you hear things, you get impressions, jot them down, write them down. And uh, whether it's an iPad or whether it's a notepad, it doesn't matter what it is. Jot those things down. And when I did go to bed that night, just minutes after, uh, I lay there for quite some time. Instead of going into that, uh, that usual state of sleep, I began to just ponder. And I thought, this is so profound. And in the morning it was still with me. And of course I had it all written down. 
And I looked at it again and I thought, that was the word of the Lord. That is the voice of God. And I was able to share that in preaching. And someone spoke to me today on the phone and they said, um, love you, I love you, live streaming. It is so wonderful. But oh, last Sunday, that was the voice of the Lord to me. So God wants to use you. God wants to make you a blessing. And in closing tonight, there is always a need for obedience for everything that he gives. God doesn't just speak into the air. You know, we do as human beings. We chatter. We're, we're terrible talkers. We chatter and chatter and chatter and chatter and chatter and chatter. Drive everybody mad. I'm one of the worst uh, exponents of that. But uh, we do a lot of talking. But, you know, God does a lot of talking and he'd do a lot more talking if we'd do a lot of listening and we'd certainly do a lot of obeying. But, you see, when God speaks, he, expect, he expects a response. He doesn't waste his breath. God reveals in order for you to receive and to yield and obey. So when you are praying, oh God, I want you to speak into my heart. I want you to clarify your word. You know, he will certainly do that. But he will be wanting to reveal in order for you to receive, to yield, and to obey. And the great Stephen Olford, the great Baptist preacher, at Calvary Baptist in uh, West 57th Street in New York City, said these words. It sort of just found a lodging place in my heart when he said it. He said, Revelation and obedience go hand in hand. As God reveals, you will obey. As you obey, God will further reveal. He will continue to reveal while you continue to obey. When you cease obeying, he stops revealing. Now, I've got a scripture that says exactly that. Exactly that. And it's found in uh, the book of Acts and chapter 16. Oh, it's a beautiful chapter 16. You could go for weeks on chapter 16. The way that uh, Lydia's beautiful heart was open to the Spirit of God. You know, God doesn't always speak with a thunderclap. It's sometimes a still, small voice. And while Paul was talking to her, Lydia and her friends, quite a sophisticated little group of ladies, not a pack of gossipers. They were there in prayer. They were there seeking God. And he went over and spoke to them and he shared with them the things of Jesus. And the Lord opened her heart. Now, the Bible tells us that after this, that Paul and Silas, after the monumental thing that happened when they were imprisoned and then the earthquake and then the jailer getting saved and all of that. Well, the Bible tells us that God spoke to them and the Bible says that he said to them, I have a plan and the plan is this. And he saw a man appear and... Uh, this, this man was from Macedonia. In fact, it was before he even got to Philippi. And he said that this vision of a man from Macedonia, northern Greece, stood begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. And after Paul, verse 10, had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Well, God gave them fruit for their obedience. Lydia, the Philippian jailer, 
the young girl that he delivered from a demon spirit, and then, of course, planted a church and kept on planting throughout that region. Did you like that? I loved it. I thought it was wonderful. The night that he had that vision of a man dressed in Macedonian garb, come over and help us, and he said immediately, we made plans to go. You see, that's a revelation accompanied by obedience. I hope that you're not just a person that wants to be able to say, oh, God speaks to me. God's not an entertainer, friends. He doesn't speak to you because he wants to titivate your senses. He doesn't want to give you a thrill. He will speak to you because he wants to reveal things to you. And if it's to your soul, it's for adjustment of your soul. If it's for service, it's for you to yield to that service. If you want a perpetual, ongoing flow of revelation in your soul, in your heart, and in your life, I'll tell you what to do. Obey. Obey. This is our last time that we'll be speaking on the voice of God. And uh, I trust that it comes down to this. Know the message. Seek the Lord. Cultivate an understanding of how he speaks to you. And when he speaks to you, obey. And when you obey, the windows of heaven will be open. The glory of the Lord will will appear to you. You've got no idea what God has planned for you. As Paul said to those in Corinth, he says that the Lord has got great things planned for you. He says elsewhere, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into your imagination the things that God has prepared for those that love him but he has revealed to us by his spirit. And as you obey, so he'll continue to reveal. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have progressive revelation because you never, ever disobeyed or were reluctant? Oh, you will be fearful at times and you will think to yourself, oh, can I do this? No, I can't. And then he gives grace so that you can. God bless you. Lovely to be with you. Don't forget next Sunday morning, we've got a very special guest. Vicky's coming to lead us in worship, and uh, that'll be beautiful. We've got also uh, a wonderful testimony, and we've got a message that I believe God will do something through into your heart, my heart, all of our hearts. So pray about it. like to thank those that are giving to missions, to, um, and, and those that have been faithful in giving, uh, even today, coming by and yesterday and the day before that, coming along to our home and handing their tithes in or going across to the church office and leaving uh, monies there for the Lord's work. God bless you, and uh, the Lord uh, will bless you for your faithfulness in giving. Don't be a taker, be a giver, and God will give his best to you. I'll see you on Sunday, if not before. God bless you.